Welcome, everybody. Um, we are very excited to have you here with us today. My name is Sarah Zeller Berkman. I'm academic director of youth studies programs at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Um, so thank you for joining us in the second of a series of virtual events that we're doing about building youth worker power in the youth sector. And this is hosted by the Youth Studies Program at CUNY SPS and the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, I'm super excited for tonight. I always love these events because you know we come together to learn from and with each other. And these are rich spaces where we present, um, you know, possibilities for collective consideration. And then we explore some of the opportunities and challenges that may arise. And so the conversation that we're gonna have tonight about worker owner cooperatives are critical for our field to, to think about for many reasons, but um, here's some of what's top of mind for me today. Um, so, so capitalism is not working well for the young people that we work with or for most young people or people on this planet, right? So. If we want to be part of a positive youth development um, field that partners with young people to challenge status quo and not just maintain it, we have to really think critically about the messy interactions between our field and things like capitalism, uh, systems of white supremacy that, that maintain concentrated wealth, right? So how can we be part of, of a transition to a more just economic system for all? How are we teaching young people to value their labor? How are we creating organizations that value those who work with young people and really put solidarity, democratic practices, transparency, and power sharing at the center of their work for both young people and adults? Um, so anyway, that's we're, we're very excited to hear from panelists tonight who are, who are structuring, structuring their organizations to build the power of those who work in them and then we're also going to hear from those who are supporting young people to create their own jobs, really built on cooperative principles um, that are responding to community needs and desires and dreams. We've designed this event to have three parts. So we have this, this welcoming and this framing, um, which my colleagues will continue in a minute. Then we're going to have the panel um, who are of people that are kind of at all stages of developing cooperatives. And then we have some time for small group discussion to digest what we've heard. And um, our panelists have been kind enough to join us in the breakout room. So they'll be facilitating conversation. They're there to answer any other questions that come up. And then we'll close. So now I'm gonna pass it to um, Cassie Brodus foot She's the Director of Partnerships at Beam Center and an alumni of the first ever cohort of the Masters in Youth Studies programs. And she'll continue to frame the event and welcome you all. And, and I just wanna say briefly that when Cassie came into the Youth Studies program in 2016, 2017, she was thinking about co-ops and our field. And we began to kind of plant some seeds for this event, taken far too many years, um, but, but we're here. Cassie, I'm gonna pass it over to you. You can continue to frame the day. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome to everyone here who is also clearly interested in this. Um, when Sarah says she's excited, I'm also excited. I'm like vibrating. She's right. Um, I've been thinking about this for a really long time, um, and I'm so grateful to Sarah uh, for you know, creating the Youth Studies program. Um, and being such a welcoming force for many youth workers hopefully all over the world soon. Um, but when I originally found out about worker co-ops, it was through uh, an, uh, a podcast called uh, Economic Update with Richard Wolf. And when I learned about it, it was like such a powerful, deep feeling in my body um, because for the last maybe 12 years, I worked at a summer camp with my current boss and friend and colleague, Brian Cohen, with uh, you all hear from him shortly. But if anyone has ever been to a summer camp or is in a youth space um, and is here with us, you understand the importance of changing the hierarchy between learner and teacher, um, the strength in youth adult partnerships, and why 
that language and feeling of worker co-op goes so hand in hand with what we'll be learning more about tonight. Um, and I'm so excited for the panelists because I have such a deep feeling about it because someone shared with me, we are just uncovering our, how we used to interact with our communities many, 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 however long ago. So I think that's why I have a really deep connection to it because it feels like this is how we should live and organize with the people who we care about in our communities. Um, so I won't, I don't, I don't wanna take up too much more time from our panelists because we have a lot, a lot to get into tonight. Um, but I urge you to, uh, you know, look at the resources that will be shared with you. Um, and you know, continue to understand that if we do this right very soon, we will all have more uh, contributions to the way that we exist in our workspaces. Um, and we'll also be able to not leave youth behind uh, with how we are looking towards the future and are experiencing our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so I'm excited to learn more uh, from the panelists and the experts that we have here. Um, and I know there's still some folks coming on into the room, um, but I think it could be a, do you think we're at a good enough place to see who's in the room now? Cause I could keep going. Yeah, yeah let's start, <laughs> let's start the, the poll in the poll. Okay, okay, great. So I, um, with the help of the fantastic team here of the SPS uh, media crew, we will be starting some poll questions just to get a little um, little understanding of who's in the room here. So please, you should see popping up now. Let us know how familiar you are with the idea of worker-owned cooperatives. I see the numbers coming in. This is like election night. I love it. But another, you know, in information I actually want to know. So this is, this is great, very interesting here. Sorry, Heather, if we're here, we are, there we go. Yep, so valued, I'd say, uh, do you feel like your boss knows your name? <laughs> if you don't think so, then I would say no. Uh, but if you feel like you can communicate your ideas and um, your boss knows your name, then you'd be on the uh, higher end of the spectrum there should be an interesting range thinking of the different places that we work size of your organization is gonna impact this I'm, I'm sure Heather I guess we'll be ready for our next question in a couple of seconds all right let's see I have control over my own labor now again I think that'll depend on your work and the size of your organization but do you feel like you are, you know, if you're overworked, can you communicate that to your, to your partners, to your boss? Um, do you have someone to talk to about that? Um, are you working overtime and not really, you know, is it just assume that you have to do work if it's not finished between your nine to five? Seems rather important. We spend most of our day at work like young people spend most of their day at school. All right, almost everyone has participated. I think we can probably move on to the next question. All right, so if you are lucky enough to have young people working with you, um, do you feel that they are treated like collaborators or are they looked at like, uh, people that you're just doing programming for? Are they true stakeholders? Um, are they in consider, do you, are they in your mind when you're making decisions about exactly what you're doing? Are you thinking more about the grants perhaps that you might be trying to write for the young people? Seeing some interesting results coming in here. Excited to hear some of our panelists talk about this. This will definitely it's a major key, I think. All right, 82% participated. I think we can uh, move on to our last polling question. All right, 
At my organization, we educate youth about the value of their labor. Now this question, very interesting because I feel like for many of us, um, it might be a new conversation, even for us as workers ourselves. Um, so if you're already having these conversations with your young people, kudos. And it looks like we are correct that it is not necessarily a very popular conversation right now. But that's why we're here. We're gonna learn more about it and hopefully, uh, hopefully be able to start communicating at whatever level we are at. Well, thank you all for listening to me passionately talk about this and um, thank you, Heather, for organizing the polling and uh, Sarah, let's see what's happening next. Yeah, um, thank you, Cassie. Um, really interesting to see that a lot of people felt pretty valued in their workspaces, which is wonderful. Um, and also, yeah, are not necessarily yet talking about uh, with young people about labor, um, valuing their labor, et cetera. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass it over right now to continue uh, to my colleague, um, dear friend, and one of the foremost thinkers and doers in relation to worker owner cooperatives, Rebecca Laurie. Um, she'll continue to frame the day. So just a little bit of a introduction and bio. Rebecca is the founder of the Community and Worker Ownership Project at the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, they have a wonderful advanced certificate program for those who are interested in starting cooperatives, which Rebecca you know, founded, and she also serves as, as adjunct faculty in the Urban Studies Department. She is a founding member of the worker-owned cooperative New Deal Home Improvement Company. She serves on, on the boards of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative and Democracy at Work Institute. And she's really you know, a go-to person in relation to building capacity of those doing cooperatives. We're very, very lucky to have Rebecca here who can share her deep wealth of knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to you, Rebecca, to continue frame the day and then get us started with the panel. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you so much, Cassie, for setting that up. I would love us to see the results of question number one. Can we share that with everybody? Um, sure, Rebecca, give us just one quick second. Okay, okay. Because I think what was interesting is that uh, most of the answers were sort of evenly, more or less spread out. Although uh, the teaching the value of our labor, not as much. Um, so thank you for that great introduction, Sarah. Cassie, thanks for setting this up. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to share with us and to get to the panel. So let me just say a few things. When I, when I talk about worker co-ops, and the reason I want to see question number one was how familiar are you? I think what I love about cooperative economics is cooperative is sort of a, a, a qualifying word and adjective that we kind of get. Like we cooperate, we teach it in kindergarten, nursery school. It's like everything you need to know you learned when you were three. I'll thank you for that. So, and that's enough for me to see and maybe everybody else how we were sort of scattered in the uh, familiarity with that question. So when we think about co-ops, I like to say, um, it's really about a deep democracy. And when we think about a deep democracy, we think that everybody can be engaged. You can stop sharing that now, Heather, thank you. It's a way to think that everybody truly can engage. And uh, Sarah and Cassie both sort of frame this with the system is broke, we need to fix it. I think many people who work to empower youth know that the system is broke and people are feeling oppressed and put down or one up and chip and put down chip happens all the time. And how do we actually think about a deeper democracy where we can listen to each other is a space where we are thinking about healing each other while we show up. So how do we do that at work? There's some active listening that happens at work. Are we lucky enough to do it? Um, maybe, is it done by those in power? Hopefully, but often not enough. So really thinking about the entities we go to work in and how they can act cooperatively. Co-ops have a full structure to them. I don't wanna get into all of that, but basically it means that every member has an equal say and vote. And what that starts to mean is that we are really paying attention to inclusion when we wanna have an equal say. 
So I know that in um, youth work, in good youth work, in good community organizing work, we do a lot of asset-based development, strength-based. What's the best thing that's happening here? That is applied directly to any entity that's run cooperatively. And we're gonna move soon to our speakers and let them talk a little bit about that because I wanna make sure in their introduction of what they do, they're also able to talk about um, how the best practices are being practiced where they are. And there's a lot of legalese for co-ops. I can say if you're interested more, we have classes at the School of Labor and Urban Studies for this, but I don't wanna make this as much of a pitch as an orientation where we can really appreciate what's already happening and then see how we can do more of that. So I wanna start by really saying, we're gonna do an appreciative inquiry right here for who's doing what in co-ops and or cooperative structures in their places of work. And um, we're gonna give out some resources afterwards that I'll just reference quickly so that you know, um, the, there's a model for movement generation for a just transition that does a beautiful, beautiful image of everything we wanna tear down and stop all that oppressive behavior, but also everything we wanna build and include. And the cooperative model is something that really can take us to the place of what we build. Um, there's other things in, the, um, in that shared document that you'll see, but um, I'll maybe reference them as we go on tonight. So I'll let it turn over to our speakers and our panel. And, um, say basically, when we say we're trying to bring out the best in people when we work with youth, are we doing it with each other and with them? And is there a structure in which we can do it? Because we can each mean well, but is there a lot of support top down all around to make sure that we're bringing out the best and we have room and rules and guidelines and support to get that done? Um, I think I'll turn to the panel just to sort of in the interest of time when I look at my schedule, is that right, Sarah? Um, so we're going to introduce uh, Brian Cohn, um, Addison Turner, Lucia Rail, and Camus Franklin, if they can come into the room. So to, thanks so much. So to save myself the time of uh, not fully introducing you, and I love the document that um, SPS has put together. Thank you so much, Heather and Janira, to put together a document that has everybody's descriptions and the links, and you can read more about everybody. I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself, uh, your organization, and what you do, and tell us about what led you to do cooperative structures in your work. And we'll start with you, Addison. And so you can be ready in my screen. It would be Addison, Kamal, Brian, and then Alethea. So thank you um, for organizing this event and allowing me to speak on the very um, inspiring work that people in my community are up to. Um, so my name is Addison Turner. I'm born and raised and based in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is a mid-sized post-industrial city currently undergoing rapid gentrification. Gentrification literally means to be altered in the image of the gentry or to be changed to suit the needs of the gentry gentry, of course, being the upper class, and thus to be um, a generous gentleman is a mark of upper class distinction, a historical development that obscures the fundamental contradiction between the ru ruling and the uh, exploiting classes. Through that lens, we can see the connection between charity, paternalism, and the persistence of an uh, economy based upon the fundamentally exploitative social relationships, the capitalist mode of production. I say this because in large part, I was attracted to this work because of the attractiveness and importance of the questions and the problems associated with, with managing our collective lives. Uh, for example, why does charity not work as a means for the oppressed to acquire justice? Why is systemic racism so strong after the Emancipation Procl uh, Proclamation, after the civil rights era? In answering these questions, I think that I approach a vital question, um, which is how do we approach a situation in which we're faced with two choices, socialism or barbarism, cooperation or annihilation. I also attribute much of the guidance to this past, uh, to this work as being derived from my experience as a black person. Just 
uh, being black led me to radical thinking about power, United States, and about revolution. Revolution being the main trend in the universe and my desire to be in touch with it is a constant uh, um, undercurrent uh, in my life. Knowing that the best of my ancestors struggled, died, and therefore lived for a liberation from slavery, and knowing that the mission of Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, Cyril Briggs, and Malcolm X is incomplete, whether um, or not we take it seriously, being inheritors of this struggle is a natural fact. To die for revolution is heavier than a mountain. To die in a state of revision or reaction is light as a feather. Furthermore, as a Muslim, my role in life is to struggle against tyranny and oppression wherever uh, I find them. And I find uh, a great source of support through the practice of Islam, which I don't take full enough advantage of. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. Last but not least, I'm led to this work through the support and the mercy of so many people, my family, my partner, with, without whom I would not have learned to speak, how to make collective concern um, about the world, um, how to have access to the sustenance that gives me the space to think um, and to act. Um, and the fact that I'm here despite uh, so many challenges, including uh, drug addiction, um, has led me to acknowledge the will of the creator um, of the universe for having brought me here to this work with any semblance of traction or success. Um, I hope that we all gain access to a system of intergenerational support to transmit the knowledge of who we are and where we fit into the historical task of mankind to get this right in the short life that we have to live. And that you transmit and emit revolutionary love everywhere that you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Addison. Such a deep uh, frame for who you are and what leads you to this work. Kamal? Oh, thanks for having me. And, and I want to echo um, Addison. I thought that was, uh, that was really deep and cool. Um, uh, so briefly, I'm from uh, Brooklyn, New York originally. I've been an organizer for well over 30 years now. Uh, now I'm uh, basically in the land of Georgia. I come to my organizing uh, because my mom uh, brought me up and told me stories about the civil rights movement. She's from Charleston, South Carolina. She lived through Jim Crow. Uh, and I tell people often now that you know she tells a story about having a scar on her back to this day when she played in a white Sony playground and was chased out by the police and wasn't fast enough and got hit in the back uh, with a billy club. So um, that got me on the path of thinking about how the world works. We grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, um, how wealth is distributed, um, how racism works, how white supremacy works. And that got me into organizing in my 20s uh, and basically mainly joining black collectives and organizing. Um, and that organizing in Brooklyn led me to do a lot of different work around the issues of police brutality, youth organizing. I became a lawyer. Um, during that time, I met uh, Sarah and became great friends with her. Um, and so part of even doing um, tonight's panel was just an opportunity to see her face um, because it's been a long time. Um, and so uh, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and through all of my organizing travels, again, I've, I've been either a part of or starting or starting organizations. I believe that when people come to work that's involving the collective or, um, uh, or community, um, that part of that has to be working together in shared space. Um, and so out of that, I organized or started a group called Community Movement Builders. And we are basically a community organizing group. We do work around the issue of gentrification uh, in Atlanta, uh, which can be done in any major city around uh, the country right now, which, you know, simply, uh, I, I appreciate Addison's uh, uh, definition. Uh, and my simple definition, it's really, you know, when developers and city government team up to push poor people, meaning black people out of communities that they've been in for a long time, uh, under the auspices of bringing development and really what they're doing is bringing resources for a managerial class and usually for richer people uh, to take over. And that pushes poor people or working class people 
further away from not only their own community, but from their own jobs and services and so forth. Uh, we also do work on police brutality uh, in the city of Atlanta. Um, and then we also do another kind of work that we call sustainable development. And part of that work is where we do our mutual aid, a sustainability fund to help pay people in the community that we work in, uh, their rent, their utilities, uh, their mortgage. Um, and then lastly, we do cooperatives. And we're a small organization, as in we're a not, we have a 501c3, but we consider ourselves a radical revolutionary black organization. So we work as a collective, right? Even though we have the formal structure, we work as a collective. And I think for the first time, even talking about cooperatives, I've looked at our, I look at our structure as a cooperative structure because our structure is one in which we share ideas, we take votes, um, that we do things collectively to make decisions in terms of how we move, where we move, and what we do. Specifically, when it comes to cooperatives, we have several cooperatives that are in various stages of development. We have a CMOS cooperative that we actually sell in a cooperative grocery store and another local grocery store. We have an aquaponics cooperative that we're developing that's basically a large scale uh, cooperative that's going to be in a shipping container um, that's going to have a greenhouse connected to it. And that's in the development stage. We have a security cooperative that's basically doing cop watches and will be doing security patrols in the community. And that will be manned by and peopled by young people, um, uh, people over 18, but young people with training from people who have some security background. We are developing a kale chip cooperative. We have a community garden that will be a place where we get some of our kale chips from as well as, well as wholesaling. Um, and we have a vending machine cooperative, um, which is a cooperative that is being sold to us. Uh, it used to be a regular business uh, and it's being sold to us so that we can develop it into a cooperative and hire people. Uh, most of the labor on our cooperatives, and I'll wrap up after this, is volunteer labor. Um, and we're getting to the stage of where we're actually hiring our first worker owners. Um, and so because we work as a collective and as an organization, most of the labor that we, that we all contribute to the work that we do is done so through an ideological lens of we, us doing it because we support and we wanna do work in our community to move us away from capitalism. Um, but we also know that uh, although this work is quote unquote volunteered, that we are not really doing the work at the level or model that it needs to be until we can actually sustain people with that work. Um, and so uh, we want to do that work so that we don't fall into the trap of only depending on foundations and grants as a source of income, as well as providing income for workers. Um, and so ours is a little bit of a hybrid model of trying to support individuals and supporting an organizational apparatus that's meant to organize in the community. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Kamal. Wow. Great. Yeah, Brian, it's all yours. Tough acts to follow. And um, as we go, it's wonderful to hear everybody share their perspective and their work, please. Yeah, um, uh, so so wonderful. I, I, I've, I feel like I've already gotten everything I need out of um, this evening by listening uh, to Addison and, and Kamau uh, speak. Um, my name is Brian Cohen. Um, I'm a co-founder and executive director of Beam Center. Um, I came to the, this place um, from a long journey uh, that started very differently than Addison and Kamau. Um, as Cassie mentioned, um, about 17 years ago, uh, my partner Danny, who's on the call, and I started uh, a sleepaway camp for young people. Um, and uh, at the time, the reason I, I wanted to start a camp was because I had such uh, an unbelievable experience as a, as a child and, and a young person of um, collaborating with young, with, with adults, adults who uh, didn't treat me like a student, but treated me like a creative collaborator. And so it was my desire and Danny and my sh shared desire to create um, a similar kind of opportunity and environment for, for other young people. So uh, we started um, Beam Camp in, in New Hampshire. Um, and the, the, the idea that we had was that we were going to uh, 
uh, go out into the world and look for big ideas from big thinkers, architects, designers, sculptors, and um, ask, invite young people into the forest to, to learn how to make those big ideas happen with the hope that um, what they got out of that, in addition to learning how to make things with their hands, uh, was the, the agency and the confidence that, that their ideas mattered and that they were valuable and that they were possible, no matter how big they were. Um, and uh, Danny and I, you know, loved what we were doing. And um, through the help of uh, many people who are on this call right now, um, were able to um, bring that idea into uh, a New York City uh, context and uh, start figuring out uh, how this this notion of uh, the power of making things together um, could benefit anyone, young people. Um, and um, we started uh, trying to discover and learn what what uh, what was actually happening within this process of uh, large scale collaboration and um, we found our way into um, the systems uh, that support young people or purport to support young people in New York City. Um, we collaborate with um, many public schools um, and um, through that work, we started um, being able to hire young people, teenagers, uh, to help us, help us do this, make these things. Um, and I got involved uh, not only with the Department of Education, uh, but with uh, as a as a provider of summer youth employment um, with DYCD, which is how I meet how I know and have have enjoyed meeting so many uh, of the people on this call right now. Um, but through that journey, what we we started to uh, feel and 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 realize is that. Um, Young people, um, it's not enough to pay a, a young person minimum wage. It's important, um, but it's not enough. If the experience of, of work and labor that they have is based on um, th their labor a, a, as, a, a, as a unit and um, as um, within a system where they are not in control of the work they do, uh, that that work is not meaningful to them, uh, that they are not learning um, in, in the context of their work. And so as a, as a nonprofit, uh, we started thinking about how we could be not just teachers of the value of young people's labor, but be the model of what working in a cooperative, um, always learning and um, learning together environment as a laborer can be. So uh, we, of course, first stop was to look in, in inwardly and say, uh, are the adults who are employed here um, feeling that way? And so about a year and a half ago, we, we started a very intensive conversation about um, how we all felt as uh, workers here. And um, it's an ongoing conversation um, that, um, that is, is really one that is uh, in preparation for being able to welcome young people and, and we, we employ quite a few um, as collaborators and, and, and co-workers. Um, the other thing that I wanna say in relation to some of the things Kamau and Addison were saying is that the other thing that we got involved in is funding through government contracts. Um, and as many of you know, um, those contracts are structured um, really uh, based on a plantation system. And um, because of that, 
um, we, as a, as a contractor, um, you, if you are not thoughtful about how you um, comply, you end up running a plantation. And uh, this is uh, the fundamental struggle and tension that we all have to work against. Um, you got to get the money to do the work, yet you also have to build capacity and resistance and thoughtfulness about how you do the work. Um, so I'm going to leave it right there for now um, and uh, pass it on to Alethea. Howdy, y'all. Um, my name is Aletia. Um, thank you to Brian, Addison, and Kamu. If I'm sorry if I'm mistaking your name, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, thank y'all for sharing. Uh, okay, so my I started like activism and artistry about a decade and a year ago. So yeah, I'm 24 now. So when I was about 13, I start I got um inspired by activism and everything that it stood for. Um, I was always, I felt very lost before I got into activism. And um, there were times where like, it would just like, it, it made me feel like I was at home. Like I was a person, like a human being. And every time that I stepped out of like activist spaces, like I would step into like, not necessarily the real world, but like the, a lot of um, colonized like mindsets and like like cor cor corporate like and all that. And sorry, y'all, I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, in 2000, in 2017, I ended up getting accepted into this magical program called Girls Gender Equity under the Young, Wom Young Women's Advisory Council out here in BK. And um, it was an intergenerational panel who then also um, had opportunities and coalitions with many different um, organizations that in turn introduced me to Global Action Project who unfortunately had to close their doors due to the pandemic. Um, but through that came the birthing of my of the company that um, me and some of the alums from GAP have co-created together and it's called Shadow Work Media. The reason why we picked that name is due to the fact that um, we still exist in a society that tries to paint everything with positivity and like being happy all the time. Um, and we know that that reality for marginalized people is not a reality. It's a facade that is presented to us. Um, and through shadow work is when you get to the nitty gritty and you, you um, essentially, you feel everything that you have been um, repressing. Every, like you get to express yourself in many different ways. And we want to be able to make media that has people thinking and has people like questioning. And through that, um, we would like to be able to offer like community. This is how I got inspired by the work, by the way. But we would like to have community training for an intergenerational panel on how people can utilize um, media to their own benefit because we know that it's ran by six conglomerates who essentially whenever they tell our stories it's always done in a very like narrow-minded very demonic like demonizing us as a collective um and sharing whatever they want to share rather than allowing us to share our stories because we know that we're perfectly capable of sharing our stories it's just we're not ever really given that opportunity and through that work we would like to offer that opportunity to other people and stuff and yeah <laughs> okay thank you Alicia. that's beautiful and um so many things are popping up in my mind that I want to make some connections before I pitch the next question. So let me let me say a few things. Um, since everybody spoke about themselves a little bit, I want to share this about me. Is when I was about ten years old, there was the biggest strike in New York City of the school system that only some people on this call will remember. But it's something we all should know. And it was a strike partly because the black community in Ocean Hill Brownsville was fighting for community control. While it was 1960s, integration was important. And some of us were looking at busing and integration or parent, my parents at the time, you know, how do we integrate? But uh, 
a number of us, including my mother, turned to what was happening in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and said, wow, maybe that's really, it's not about integrating, it's about control. And I think for me, that was a, a, a learned experience before I had a political analysis to say the best way to fight a system is to give people control and let them decide. That's what we need. And that was really in my bones from a very young age. So as I learned about co-ops, it became very important for me to unwrap what does that mean to have control? And it's in the bylaws of what cooperativism means. It's one of the principles, um, but we all feel it. And when um, anyone may be working with a group of youth or even ourselves putting together this conference, for example, you, know, you go around, you ask everybody what they think, you get opinions, you come to the best idea. That's some basic stuff. Um, so one of the things that was mentioned is um, that co-ops are businesses, but you know we all go to work each day. I mean, there are other kinds of co-ops and I won't get into all that, but to sort of say there are consumer co-ops, you might buy your food together and have a group. Members are the people who buy. You may have a housing co-op, members are the people who bought into that property. But a worker co-op is those of us work together, we own and control it and manage it together. And so I wanted to sort of demystify this because there's a lot of ways we might use co-op, but in this case, we're really talking about our work. And um, there's something I reference in the um, in the reference in the resources that you'll get that talks that references uh, Sarah Jaffe who wrote a book, um, "Work Won't Love You Back." We love our work when we are working with youth or when we are working for social change, we love our work. But if we are exploited with our time and attention and we're not fully recognized, then there's, there's this incongruency that happens. And we're trying to say, we wanna be the change we seek in the way we do our work. And that's what each of you are, are striving and, and doing in different ways. It's, and you know, Brian talked about the colonialism of the nonprofit industrial complex and we have to, do things a certain way. Uh, we're all stuck in that. We, we can't get to a future state yet. We are in the current state making the change in these places. And I want to invite us to talk about that and recognize, I love this. I think it was Kamal that spoke about so many different businesses in Atlanta that you're building. The notion of supply chain. You know, if somebody loves, I don't know. I mean, I, I love kale chips. I got a shout out to the kale chips you mentioned, Kamau. I love kale chips. I'm, I even make them in my oven once in a while. Can I go into business doing that, right? Maybe, but there are a lot of things to making a business go well. So without going into all of that now, there's a lot that goes into making any entity run effectively and cooperatively. I once had someone tell me co-ops are so complicated. I actually think capitalism is so complicated. There's this invisible hand. I don't want to go into it, but it's not so complicated to say, what do we all need and what do we all do and what do we all have to contribute? It follows something most of us can intuit that says, how do we bring out the best in each other? How do we do this strength-based presencing and say we're here? And that also, by the way, does a lot to heal some trauma that's well-baked into us because of everything that colonialism has put on us, capitalism, gender, oppression, go on down the list. So trying to create spaces where all that healing can happen, it might be complex, but it might be actually intuitive. And I think the younger you are, the easier it is to even get to that intuition. So um, I wanted to, when you mentioned supply chips, uh, kale chips, I thought supply chain, that there are a lot of businesses we will need no matter where we go, what we need. And I often say every economy needs food, care, repair, and the arts. Businesses that do food, care, repair, and the arts. And the repair comes into Beam Center where people are learning how to use tools and food when they're growing kale and drying it to just the right amount, all of this. But you also have to know how to run the business and you have to understand how the finances work. And so we're in this sort of transitional phase from current state, future state in every little bucket where these co-ops are being created. So I wanna turn the next Set a quite the next question is to go and pick a story in your co-op or in your work where there's cooperatives that really can identify how you created it or how you're expanding the work. Is how is it from the ground up or from the bottom up um, or from the outside in? Where are the pressures to make it work well? And what are the things you're doing? Sometimes I say, you know, follow the money. 
who's making the decisions on the money becomes a way to sort of say, are we really being democratic? But also, how are we listening? How are we making the decision of the business, perhaps? What businesses we go into, what work we pursue. So a little bit of um, each of you can talk Pick a story inside your operation of how you are, you know, beginning to be the change, setting the terms of that change, and um, being as democratic as you can in this face of this monster. And uh, maybe I'll see who wants to go first. If you like the order we went, that was Addison, Kamal, Brian, and Alethea. But maybe somebody wants to go first. Addison, you ready? Yeah, I'll try. Thank you. <laughs> that's, Thank you. you can that's go on. Very, it's a very um, loaded and complex question or set of questions. Um, and I'll try my best here because um, I think the question of how we have expanded cooperative work, I would start that answer with a caveat that I'm not sure that we have expanded it. Um, we know from um, Peter Kropotkin, uh, mutual aid as a factor in evolution and um, the work of um, the black cooperatives in the South for uh, so many years that um, the, the cooperative work itself is intrinsic to um, our behavior as human beings and even as uh, living animals, right? That um, 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 we also can keep in mind that our life as human beings now is a result of a long um, um, evolutionary process. And I remember learning one theory when I was um, still in uh, university about um, the evolution of cooperation in life. And um, we were talking about uh, Australopithecus afarensis, which is the hominid that's most famously re uh, represented by the Lucy skeleton. And the professor was talking about um, the way that um, walking upright on two feet led to physical changes in the pelvis of the human being that led to a very um, um, arduous uh, birthing process uh, for people. And that in that it became necessary um, uh, midwifery became necessary because of the changes in um, the pelvic uh, bone structure over time. So at that point, which is 7 million years ago, cooperation became a necessary component even of our birth as um, as um, individuals, keeping in mind that that's before our the um, emergence of uh, the genus Homo um, uh, five million years later. So, because of this history, it's difficult to say if we have expanded cooperative work at all. Um, <laughs> but the story of our organization. Um, is that uh, Worcester Youth Cooperatives is the name of our um, organization. And it was founded by six high school seniors and myself in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, October, 2020. So we're a little bit over a year old now. And our mission is to support the power of young people to organize cooperative solutions to social issues they care about. Um, and, these uh, young people who I was um, in community with, they were part of another um, organization um, where um, their job was to run a cooperative business, but the office where that was located happened to be in the epicenter of the um, opiate pandemic um, um, in our city. So the youth were very, dissatisfied with the work that they were doing and they felt concerned about the homeless people in the street and the people who are um, in the street and they had the question how can we link this cooperative work to the survival um, of the most vulnerable people 
And because of, as Brian was talking about the nonprofit um, industrial complex, um, the youth collective was uh, disallowed from providing a uh, direct service to um, the homeless population that was uh, in the neighborhood. So at that point, they were left uh, with the question, do we abandon what we want to do or do we set out and form our own um, organization that in the very first moment is based on economic solidarity with uh, uh, the most vulnerable people. Um, and I can get um, more into the concrete forms that that, like, that, that spirit has taken um, over the past year. But when you um, refer to the aspect here of, about bottom up or top down, really what we were talking about today uh, actually is a key lesson that we've learned is that um, not only do the most vulnerable people, the most exploited, oppressed people in society need the most support and help, but in uniting with these people, they also turn and support the revolutionary work with more passion, with more skills than any philanthropic um, organization has, which is to say that um, 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 you know, it's sometimes difficult to maintain faith in the power of the people um, being the decisive resource that determines the success or failure of a revolutionary project and not how much money is involved in it or how much support and acceptance you get uh, from the bourgeois state. Um, we know the capacity of capitalism um, in the bourgeois state to co-opt some of uh, the most radical um, activity. So um, um, to me, that's um, my answer uh, as to a story of um, the way that these youth um, set out and form their own um, organization, which I think is worth mentioning that um, became incorporated uh, as a 501c3 nonprofit, I think in July or June. Um, so that's the concrete form that um, the co-op network to date has taken. Um, and I think um, another way that we may have um, expanded co-op work is to make a clear distinction between revolutionary and reactionary cooperation, because you know our friends, for example, they either bring out the best in us or the worst in us, and cooperation as an act can bring out the best or the absolute worst in humanity. Um, um, revolution, reaction, creation and destruction, exploitation and support are all collaborative endeavors. Um, so to make a distinction between the kind of cooperation that leads us uh, to revolution is uh, so important and not just practice cooperation for cooperation's sake or practice Thank cooperation. You, yeah, I'm gonna... um, I'll leave it at that. So. I, I see um, Lithia with her, you know with applauding because you, you're raising so many deep issues and um, we have till about 715 for this panel so I want to make sure yeah. there's time for everybody so rather than everybody answer let me just see who would want to jump in at this point which is really a bit of your okay. story and how you've done it Kamal I saw your hand go yeah I mean I'll jump in quickly there were a couple of things that came to mind when you asked the question um, and when you made the statement so one is that in terms of developing a cooperative, obviously for being on the left, we have to remember, I think you said this and just to emphasize it, worker cooperatives, economic cooperative, they have to have economic ideas, right? So we on the left are good at creating meetings for ourselves. And sometimes we wanna call it this or call it that, but you're really not developing a worker or economic cooperative if you unfortunately don't have an economic idea, that is something that you're gonna be able to trade, sell, uh, generate resource and be able to pay people out, right? Um, and I think um, uh, 
that's not a small point to skip over, but again, sometimes in left organizing, we are so interested in the conception of, uh, of a structure that's fair that we forget the other part, which is the ideas won't get off the ground and you're gonna get frustrated if you haven't started thinking about where a market is, uh, whether or not you think that's a capitalist terminology or not, but where a market is for doing this kind of work. Um, and so I think that becomes extremely important in terms, oh, gotta finish first. That Hi. becomes extremely, Hi, you gotta let me finish first. Okay. That becomes extremely important in terms of developing a cooperative idea. Um, and then two is, um, in terms of the cooperative, we've come at it from many different angles. So we've had cooperatives or we've had businesses that have been given to us per se, sort of like a top down, can we do it this way? And we've also had things that we sat around as a group and said, hey, we have an urban garden. We should take this urban garden with growing chair kale out of it. Can we take this urban garden and people, I like I have experience making kale chips. What can we do in terms of making a flavor, having connections to stores? With the CMOS, we knew a couple who were members of the organization who uh, were developing CMOS and we decided to team up with each other and to do it together because we thought that we had the connections for stores. And so we thought that would be the best way to get something moving. So, um, so for us, it's important to think about those methods in terms of moving forward, but I'm gonna stop there because the little one has given me some grief and I'm gonna handle that. Blessings to him. You know, some of what uh, Kamal was describing, I want to just give language to this, the notion of a startup and a conversion are two different ways to start of, think of a business. And we have lots of great ideas, our youth have great ideas, no lack of good ideas of what might be needed. And then the business plan to sort of say, well, will people really buy it? Can we make a living of that? Because we often do things for love and that's great. And sometimes it's not just because we love doing that thing, there's a market for it. So the conversion is looking at businesses that maybe um, the owner is willing to sell it to the workers or the workers are going to take it over from the owner and to think about how do we actually take that business and control it ourselves. I want to introduce those terms, startup and conversion, and introduce it also that in the nonprofit sector, a business can be run cooperatively and that's a business that is an entity where people make a living. And we put a great uh, piece in the chat in the uh, in the resources you'll get from um, a Solidarity Economy Law Center that has a whole toolkit for how nonprofits could convert to cooperative structures. I know Brian looked at it. Alita, did you want to say something now? Did I see you? Wait, uh, move in, Brian. I could, or I could if you want. Share a little bit about your business and you know uh, what makes it cooperative. What what. Um, I think it's so homegrown that I want to hear like, okay, what does that feel like when you go to work each day in terms of decision making? Um, I think it was Addison may have spoken about there was an idea they had to abandon it and set up set up something new. The notion of we decide, what does that look like in your business? Mm -hmm. So we have a voting process and it's not, um, so essentially, wait, let me commence really quickly and say that Shadow Work Media was started um, around the same time as Addison's co cooperative as well. And um, we're still in the works. We're still, we still even haven't really done our first production, but um, we, we have been, um, when we do get into like disagreements, we tend to have like, you raise your hand or it's like a fence and the fence essentially is um we all come back until like we either agree or we all change our mind like like it's if one person isn't like comfortable with something being presented then we we take a breather or like we we decide we we try to like break it down as to why they may feel uncomfortable um and then whether they accept or not we go forward or not and um, essentially like we've had, like there have been certain occasions where, cause we are under a fiscal sponsorship through the real world um, because we're, we still haven't commenced our, like our LLC. Um, and we're still questioning also whether we wanna be for-profit or non-profit. Um, but the, the, because of the fact that it's still very, like as Kamu was saying, um, 
it's still very plantation like in nonprofit sectors and whereas like for profit like we may have more of like a freedom to share what we'd like um so we're still questioning that but we've had situations where I'm not gonna say a name but we've had somebody with a worker owner who was having trouble with housing and so we we banded together made like a GoFundMe and we also like funded funded like their moving process and also like understood that they're not going to be able to like be a part of some meetings for some for certain occasions and we we just really like to communicate as to where we are um and by communication I mean like more so like like if we're not there mentally that day we're understanding of that and we we're not like angry at that person or like you know like how other uh, in other corporations they can it can affect the work and stuff but um yeah that's pretty much it that's great. I wanted to clarify this a little bit because we did frame a little bit under capitalism, you know, the, the economic system in which we work. Here in America, you have two choices. You can form a company that's for-profit or non-profit. Those are our legal structures. And the for-profit historically says the, 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 the wealth that's generated in the company can be extracted to the single owners. But for-profit doesn't have to mean that. It can just mean the money that's generated goes back into the people and the community. It doesn't have to be about extraction. And we're forced into that, that uh, binary for-profit, non-profit under our tax code. But let's just take that away and say, how do we share the surplus? That's another way to look at it. Think of a garden, it's August, there's a lot of zucchini that grew and it will go bad if you hoard it. You need to do something with it. You need to preserve it. You need to share it. You need to give it away. You need to eat it. You need to feast. You need to celebrate. But if you hoard it all for yourself without refrigeration, it ain't going any. It, it's not going to be a good thing except for compost. And it, it, so nature always finds its way. But the notion of, of surplus versus profit is important when we think about businesses. So you might be able to tap down a little bit about not what kind of entity am I, but where's the resources coming that's gonna make the mission of this business work or this entity. So I wanna, you know, so then we can get a little bit away of the for-profit, nonprofit idea. Although when you talk to lawyers and tax people, you need to think about that. But for here, I wanted to turn to Brian and Brian a little bit answer anything that's been on your mind thus far, but you know, the, the next question to really think about is how do you make this work in your business for, to institutionalize it. So um, you're an established nonprofit and you want to do more self-directed teams, more democratically controlled processes so that the surplus is not, um, I mean, in nonprofits, we don't extract surplus, but some people can get rich. There's a lot of unequal things that can still happen. How do you make it so that it's more democratic? Well, there, I mean, there there are different levels of um, that 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 you have to think about. I mean, we we have to exist in order for um, us to be able to employ adults and and youth, um, and um, you know we have to think about uh, where the money is coming from and um, how how decisions are made. Um, and so, you know, th there's, there, there are different ways that we can participate cooperatively internally and externally. I mean, one of the things that, uh, makes me so, uh, happy to see so, so many from the, the youth, um, development community here is that we, we are we are a community that works together and that shares. Um, uh, I, I learned in your in your class that that's one of the one of the uh, tenets of of cooperation and cooperative businesses is that cooperatives work with each other. Um, and so I think that um, you know that there is a there's sort of an ecosystem that exists uh, and is ripe to be. Um, uh, part of, uh, you know, it's co it works cooperatively to some degree already because we, we have, to, we all sort of are subject to the same conditions. So there's that level that we are thinking about um, in terms of uh, how to make change together. Um, and, and then there's the, the, the level of um, 
how how do we share learning within the organization so that everyone has the same information um, in order to to have an opinion uh, help in making decisions um, and and then at, how do we cultivate that capacity within the youth that join us um, you know they're they're we take a lot for granted as adults. We take for granted that we all understand the basics of finance and economy and, and all, all these things. Uh, we also take for granted that, um, that we all feel free enough to care about our own ideas and to value our ideas. Um, and, and one of the things that we feel most strongly about is that a young person, um, who, who is in a condition, an educational condition of compliance and conformity. Um, for that matter, a teacher who has been tasked with um, maintaining that kind of educational structure uh, has to have um, the opportunity to think more freely, to um, have a voice to um, believe that the things that they want to do are valuable, um, and so that's that's why for us, uh, starting with in the in the classroom, um, in um, by talking to teachers and talking to students about how their strengths can contribute to the making of something beautiful or functional or uh, connected to some um, area of learning is so important because if they don't feel that as adolescents, um, then they can't envision what it's like to make a decision or to uh, uh, bring an idea to market um, or to um, that, that what they've dream what they've dreamt is possible. So, um, so we, we start there and, and, and when we can welcome young people into our practice of making things together, um, and pay them to, to, to do that and to share that learning, um, we feel that we've, we've created an opportunity for them to bring together learning and the idea of labor um, in, in, in that for many of them has been separated. And um, so, uh, so, we, so we are striving to create this environment where um, adults and young people are doing similar things together and and ultimately having a similar, having, having a, a, the same kind of influence uh, in, in how the enterprise uh, moves forward. Thank you, Brian. That lined me up very nicely for some points I wanted to make sure are, are made and we can use in the breakout room as well. I wanna talk, so, you, you spoke that, you know, if people don't have information and they don't feel liberated enough to have an opinion and feel safe enough to have an opinion, and if that gets squashed for too long, they're not even going to have an opinion or feel free to, to speak, to be engaged, to be part of whatever it is we, we are doing, whoever the we is. Um, and so to me, this is about, there's a value declaration and trying to bring out the best in people and youth work and a lot of social change work. That's a value declaration. How do we make sure that we do that? What is our check and balance? Because there is, I often say, a magnetic pull to colonialist thinking. I, because I said so, or I know better. A lot of things can work into that space of uh, taking over some level of control. Um, so I wanna just mention this and uh, maybe it'll come out in the breakout rooms rather than now, but the notion of governance and management 
a lot of us know governance means, you know, the rules of how this thing runs, whether it's New York City, the US, the, you know, whatever there are, you know, any any club we might be in, any organizational structure. What's how does it run? Who gets to make the decision? Who gets to decide? And you identified, Brian, that people won't even know what to decide if they don't have information. And so there's a lot about democratizing info, right? Someone says, oh, here's a big stack of paper. You can, this is all the information you need. Well, not if I can't read or can't read that language, right? So really thinking about getting information out in a democratic way and having a process that's clear about governance is an important way to think about it. Not necessarily that every decision gets made by everyone. That can get very, very burdensome. And if I need to know if I can take a break and I have to wait for everybody to tell me yes or no, I may have, you know, not taken care of my bodily functions, right? Not everything is up to everybody all the time. So instead, there's management structures. And in management, there's ways to think about who is accountable to who, not who bosses who around necessarily. But where does the buck stop? Who has more experience? Who has more knowledge about how this thing gets built? I know the safety way of doing it. I should be in charge of safety because I don't want anyone to get hurt. And we don't have time to train everybody in the safety protocols, for example. So I think the notion of sticking with our values and having them embedded in a governance structure and a management structure is a way to create a check and balance. And um, it's going to be 715. So rather than go around with that question, that could be one of the things that gets discussed in the breakout rooms. And in the breakout rooms, what we're doing is each one of us, I think, are running a breakout. I think we have five. Is that right, Sarah? Five. Mm -hmm. And we're going to ask you, again, this is really uh, the strength-based approach. What do you already know? But also, what do you wonder? And each of us will be uh, asking someone in the room to take notes so we can have a record of this. And the questions we'll be asking are, what are things I currently do? that align with a collective framework. Particip and you know, they can respond with your own work, uh, your youth work professionally, but maybe it's something else you do. What do you currently do that aligns with a collective framework? This is very important when we want to understand that this is in our DNA as human beings. And how do we make sure we attach to it is we bring, we, we say like that, oh, I do this very well when I co-parent. I do this very well when friends come over for dinner and we all do dinner together. I do this very well with this committee at work, but not that committee at work. What is the this? What is, how do we really practice a cooperative uh, framework for participating together? Another question is where might you use the cooperative and collective framework to expand opportunities? Now you might think like, wow, you know, we could really have a bike delivery program in our neighborhood. That could be a business, but we need to put this together. And then the last question is, what do people imagine the barriers or complexities are and how can we address them? So there's, you know, what do you already do? What can you imagine? And what are some of those challenges? Um, anything else before we go into the breakout, Sarah? No, that's great. Is that framing enough? So we're going to do this for, I think we said, um, for uh, 30 minutes. It's a good amount of time. I want to make sure everybody gets a turn. So those of us who are facilitating will practice what we preach with the values of cooperativism and make sure someone's taking notes. There's a documents each of you can grab so you have it. Um, I think we're ready to go, yes? Yeah. I want to thank everybody for just you know helping to lay the groundwork from your experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I want to thank Bruni in my room who was able to take notes. Thanks so much. Got cut off before I could say so. And I think everybody's coming back in. While we come back in, it might be great to see if anybody wants to do some reporting back from their rooms. And um, yeah, we've got about 15 minutes to sort of do a debrief. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> yes, Marisol, everyone gets ejected when the time limit is up. Sorry about that. So maybe a little bit of a thank you, everybody. Everybody say thank you to everybody for participating. Um, Does anybody want to report back from our room? I'll put the notes in the chat. This is Addison's. Oh, thanks. 
I'll put the notes in the chat from our room. Um, and Abreem, can you put the notes in the chat for our room? Um, and Lydia, tell me if I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, you have so much good energy. Do you mind doing a report back? Okay, and just and raise your hand so that Heather can see you because she has to unmute you. Um, I do feel a little on the spot, so hopefully uh, Lydia. If, oh, hey, Sarah, what's up? <laughs> came here right from class just just to show love to youth studies um yeah. in our group we talked about a lot of things we talked about intentionality being essential in this work um we talked about how important it is to like authentically bring young people into the work uh so we talked about you know making sure that young people have both like the knowledge of like what the the intention is behind the programs that serve them um, but also to make sure that young people are fully invited into all kind of layers of participation when it comes to organizational change and transformation and development um, we also talked about relationships in the sense that it's important for there to be like connections between collectives and and collaborative enterprise and so it's important to make sure that we're not ever doing this work in isolation but to rather be really deliberate about networking um, to establish a, a much kind of broader social tapestry of different instances of collective cooperative engagement. Hopefully I covered all the main points. Please someone raise their hand and fill in the gaps that I certainly left. There's a model of socio called sociocracy. I wanna introduce this, we didn't put it in the resources but you could look it up. And sociocracy uses a model of uh, collective engagement that looks like this. Let me see if I'm able to change my, do you see this plant? This is Queen Anne's lace. It's a plant that actually looks like every little hub connects to another hub, connects to another hub. And why I like that diagram so much is it lets us really think like nature's model. I'm in this group, it's autonomous, but actually we have a connection to this group and we get to relate and make sure there's a connective tissue. And I think that addresses, Lydia, some of what you're raising um, in terms of re being relational and no one's in it alone, but also you don't have to step on each other's toes all the time. Alicia, you're, you came off, you're not, you're muted, but I think your lips were moving. No, I was like, exactly. Um, Aisha from my group has their hand raised. Hi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we talked in the group about how um, you know, we align with the collective framework about non uh, living off the grid and using a barter system living. And we also talk about like how to learn, unlearn this individualistic mindset that's been set by society. An example um, Natisha had given was like peer education groups where um, teens would learn from the experts and then they'll go out into the community and um, teach other teens about um, sexual health and reproductive health and sharing this information in this community. Um, I shared about, you know, coming from Africa, how, you know, we focus on collaborative living and collaborative working. And when I came into America, you know, we had a community where we had uncles and aunties who were not really blood related, but everyone sort of had like a collaborative way. And, you know, the culture shock of being in America and just focus on this nuclear family and how to break that um, mindset into creating sort of a economic collaboration among um, each other who are not necessarily um, related. And one thing we um, talk about using the cooperative framework to expand opportunities was providing support or doing transactional work where you know you'll provide a work for someone you know going back to that barter system of um, living and I think that was it. <laughs> I do want to mention also in the resources, you'll get some links with a reference of uh, some work by Jessica Gordon-Nembard. Jessica Gordon-Nembard is a professor at John Jay College in economics and 
and Africana Studies. And she wrote a book called Collective Courage, History, Theory, and Thought of African-American Cooperatives. Going way back, so Aisha, this is to underscore what you just said about understanding the African model of we, we have a big family here, we care for each other, that's ancient, and we need to bring it forward also. Um, indigenous rights help us realize how much indigenous communities do that. We'll do a little shout out to the Canarsie and Lenape people who are from this, where the region I sit, to say more and more collective wisdom, ancient wisdom, cooperative. Who else would like to share? I can I can share from uh, my group first. I want I want to say how um, how wonderful it is that the uh, several of the the folks that were in our room were are here not because they are specifically um, youth workers but because they're interested in finding resources um, that can um, help them uh, in their work with the family and youth and and um, active activists and, and collective groups. So. Uh, it's so great that that uh, this is a, a magnet for for you know learners um, of all sorts. Uh, we you know we talked about um, uh, some of the experiences that 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 people in our group uh, came with um, as uh, one in particular uh, tenant organizing um, to to sort of um, resist um the the taking away of a of a playground and and ha ha in, to put a to put a building in a in a public space in a, a, a public housing um development uh and how they were able to um working with with their friends and neighbors um collectively at, at with and with other organizations that that help them get organized uh fight back and and resist uh, successfully um that effort um uh, another another of our members shared that 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 he is he is um in a in a city agency that that works with groups like that um uh, on on a many different um issues um and that uh even though it's a city agency and it's somewhat hierarchical uh, there's an environment where people are able to work uh, somewhat autonomously and 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 share their their own expertise in order to solve the the, the problems that the agency's uh, looking into, um, and that that experience has um, um, you know in, in sort of inspired him to to try to find uh, cooperative environments um, in other parts of his life to work. Uh, in and um, that's what led him to to this evening, um, uh, and uh, a, another individual talked about being a defense attorney, um, who who is is always in the position of having to support um, clients um, with with referrals and information that that is just not part of their expertise, and that they work with um with uh other um uh, other attorneys to to build knowledge uh that can support not only the each each the, their client but clients that in some cases come from the same family who are dealing with different issues um so there there seems to be there in in, in all of our conversation there was a sort of um clear um clear need for collective solution finding and um, and that and that's really what our conversation re re revolved around. Great. I was going to ask Ty to report back from our group if that's okay. Um, uh, there were some things that came up that he felt he needed clarif clarification on. And Ty, would you would you report back from what was yes. discussed in our group? Good evening. So I thought in our group we focused a lot on all of the the things that work against you and the ideas of collabor collaborating around resistance, um, meaning that a lot of times there are holes and potholes and things that fall before us that make it difficult to work with youth and to garner the youth opinion and youth idea 
because of the way the system has been set up, meaning that direct communications between you and the youth has been removed. It may be an outside entity that was placed in as a middle factor intergenerational. When you talk about the younger youth versus teens versus the older generation, one issue can spark three different opinions. Um, we, I'm here as a member of the SLU organizing class for public housing leadership. And one thing that was important that I learned that came out today is that it's always a way and you just have to sometimes slow up and think about the approach. In public housing, we have so many entities working against us to say, we don't want the older generation and the young generation and the younger generation to work together because we are trying to restore or build something new. But it's important to rem remember that nothing can new can come about if we don't remember what brought us to this point? And it's upon us to work together to not allow the institutions to throw up roadblocks and block us from communicating with each other. We have to be able to listen and organize around what the goal, what the end goal, what's the target? What do we need to work towards achieving and not be worried about what's been built in front of us right now today to keep us from collaborating. So I'm 60 and you are six, but what's the common ground? The common ground is we both wanna have a place to live and what do I want in a place to live and you wanna see in a place to live? How do we collaborate on that and get to that point? Not worry about you're six and I'm 60 and what could we say to each other? Because there's something to be learned from everyone. And I, I thank my group for really bringing it out tonight. Thanks, Ty. I think I'll turn it over to Sarah to close us out with tremendous um, gratitude really to everybody who participated through and through to our speakers and um, let Sarah give some closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's just a ton of gratitude. I love the conversations that we were able to have in the small groups where we were, we were really thinking about how cooperative frameworks play out in our current work, but, but really imagining um, the work that we want to do in the future and how this plays out in you know, many parts of our lives, bringing in the, the aspect about cooperative housing, um, collective ownership in that space as well. So anyway, beautiful. Thank you so much, Rebecca Laurie, for your wisdom and facilitating a great panel. Thank you to our brilliant panelists, um, Kamal, Alethia, Addison, Brian. Um, it was so great to, to learn with you about, you know, just the, the, the power and the complexities of doing this work. Of course, my colleague, Cassie. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, Ryan and Shanira for all that you did behind the scenes to produce this event and you know for everybody we will we will send the resources that we've been referring to um, and um, and the, the, the recording um, and you know this is ongoing thank you so much for coming here with us tonight to uh, collectively um, think and learn. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you, everybody. Bye, thank everybody. You. Be blessed. Bye. Bye. Bye.